Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts, Hearts Home, and E Arts family. Hello there, and welcome back. So, guys, what I want to do, and I, I think what we want to get across is that if we look closely at a lot of different traditions, and maybe some of the smaller traditions that really get overlooked, you'll see that there is a very, very, um, well, there's a story being told from all the different tribes all over the globe, and it's kind of a consistent one. It really is pretty consistent. It is, and that's really curious because most people don't even take the time to step out of their um, their given religious system to go and look at other things and realize that, you know, these things, uh, there is a pattern to them. You're looking at a map <clears throat> from 1718, and it has a lot of different uh, tribes or what we might call Native American nations located on this map, which is of the southeastern portion over towards the central portion of the uh, U.S. And when you look at it, you may or may not recognize some names. Shawnee, maybe. Maybe Muskie, Muscogee. We know some of these tribes um, by their Americanized English, Angli Anglicanized. Uh, what would you say? Well, anyway, you know the word, the words and names that we've given to them. And when we say we again, there's many different we's. Mm -hmm. There sure is, you know, because both Cindy and myself. We both have uh, what you would call Native American uh, bloodlines. And, you know, speaking for myself, really, I learned about this uh, from the work my mother did, uh, talking to my father's sister, because my father never said a word. I mean, he was just the most quiet person you've ever met in your life. Really, I mean, he never offered anything as far as speaking. He, he really was, he was brought up in a household where... You don't speak unless you're spoken to. And he kind of was that way. I mean, even in dinner conversations and stuff just with his own family, he was quiet. And I really do think it was because of his uh, extremely strict. His He had an extreme strict Catholic upbringing. And he did share with me that many a times... Uh, for no apparent reason, or even the slightest apparent reason, he would get whacked with a ruler by the nuns in school. So, you know, he was, in so many ways, what's happened to um, so many of us, especially people of in indigenous bloodlines, you know, because their belief system was driven out of them, and they had to conform to what was given to them. But their belief system, when we start looking at all the different indigenous tribes around the globe, they, oh, they share some commonalities. And, you know, the Muskegee Creek are, are no different. And what my mother found out was that around, well, just after the Trail of Tears, um, I had a ancestor that was born on an Indian reservation in Oklahoma in the area of the uh, Cherokee. And the Cherokee and the Creek are basically uh, truly, they're from one people to a degree. And, um, you know, this is going back a, a long time now, gosh, about 180 years or something along those lines, 170 years. And Cindy's family comes from the same lineage, the Creek lineage on her dad's side. Mm -hmm. And I, I found this journey very curious because like Mike's father, my father didn't speak, um, especially about his history. He was extremely tight lipped about that. And I do believe that's because certain programs are <clears throat> um, dispelled upon to our loved ones and things happen to them. And they're taught that it's really important just to not speak so all of this time i've only really had my dna to allow it to do its own thing and that means the subconscious your subconscious dna kind of steers you and kind of guides you and 
even though I tried really hard to uh, fit in with the biblical narrative, um, I never quite fit in. I knew there was something different about me, about how I was drawn to the stars and how I was drawn to different medicines and how I was drawn to, you know, talking to different entities and how I was drawn to um, looking at things in a multi-dimensional way. And all of my life I was told, you know, that's, that's wrong. You can't do that. You're going to go to hell. So all of my life, you know, just having this brow beating that you're bad. If you look in this direction, you're going to go to hell. And that really hurt. And that was difficult. And my family, even though they loved me, they were really <laughs> quite concerned because I was so very different. I mean, even where I've been pulled to or drawn to around the United States, that's still following some of your DNA. It's like that's the subconscious that speaks inside of you. And it's important to listen to that. And it's curious because we do have other family members that were pulled and drawn to other areas just that are like towards sacred mountains just to realize that that's really a big part of their lineage. It's something that they were drawn to subconsciously. They were not given any written instruction at all. So our DNA is very important. It's a huge driver in our lives and we should recognize it. Now, if there's trauma, then that needs to be recognized too because you could play out your parents' trauma. If you don't know how bad they were traumatized or what was done to them, you could come out and you could be a being with that frequency that's been traumatized and actually turn into a victim, you know, because that's in the lineage. So this also goes and speaks to the ancestral healing that we need to do for ourselves. And because of that silent DNA, we really need to do the ancestral healing. And most of us, I believe at this point in time, are really from so many different divergent backgrounds as we look at a representation of some of the people of the Creek Nation, the Muskegee Nation on the right, and some of the, you know, colonists uh, ultimately coming from the European uh, continent over on the left and ultimately also representing the modern control matrix which we may or may not recognize or realize so this is from 1748 I love looking at all these old maps they're really really beautiful and I got to tell you something that's really cute about the creek when I was learning about them and their given name became Creek, not because of any real special reason, but because they were the Indians that were down by the Creek. So that's what the whites uh, decided to call them is Creek. So they adopted it. They were a very loving and giving and um, very beautiful indigenous people very kind and especially really open to other dimensions and understanding that and that's another reason why I am the way I am I'm able to read into uh, different areas because I'm picking up on my own ancestral DNA so it's already written in my programming I just need to speak it out and I do work on that and I've been working on this for well honestly since childhood and then life happens to so many people and you put these things down and then other stuff in your life happens and you decide okay well I need to pick this back up so it was about revisiting childhood which has uh, helped me pick this ability back up and, and walk with it as we look at this particular map right here which is showing the Cherokee uh, territory up in the north there homeland of the five tribes and the Creek territory below as you see all the, the rivers and then Chickasaw to the left Choctaw below that Seminole down in Florida you know it's so sad that everything gets written over time and time again and really, this is, it's more than just Europeans rewriting the ways of the indigenous people of the Americas. This is the controllers trying to erase a whole culture 
And the reason why they try to erase the culture is the knowledge shared and the understanding and the legends. When we look to uh, the stories, and, and we do have um, a couple of PDFs and some articles that I'll, I'll link to this, you see so many different similar stories. Like one of the things that they recognize is beings that come from the sky and teach us how to do things, teach us how to farm better, teach us how to cultivate land. In many cases, too, there's this one legend of uh, beings from the sky that actually get take somebody up into what it, it really seems like a UFO abduction experience of a sort, hands them these new uh, seeds and, and, and plants to plant that are going to give them better crops, better food supply, more reliable, more nutritious. They come down to earth again after being taken up into the heavens and then they go plant them and, and this was a blessing from uh, those from the sky above. When I was talking to a friend of mine who still, I'm sure, watches this um, show on a regular basis, he is of a Cherokee uh, branch, you know, he, he, he said his nation, the Cherokee nation and the Cherokee and the Creek are again, uh, if, if not cousins, they're really from the same root. It's just known the reptilian problem in issue and that there's more than one type of reptilian being, you know, there are the very, very dark reptilians that do come from the sky and there's also the reptilians that are under our feet and have been from uh, un, you know under our feet the whole time humanity's existed. They've already been here. Now those treat with caution and care. Um, they are to be treated in a very respectful manner and probably steer clear as much as possible. But they're different than the reptilians that come from the sky, which are completely negative towards humanity, always looking to use and abuse humanity. What's interesting, too, is that the Creeks, um, if you look to their their version of Genesis, it actually starts with them in the Rocky Mountains. And it actually starts with them coming up from the earth yet again in the land to the west with the mountains that are the backbone of the earth, you know, again, the Rockies in that area. And it goes along perfectly with what we hear from the Hopi. That, you know, basically, there were these very intelligent beings, whether we want to call them extraterrestrial, inner earth beings, because it's actually both things going on, uh, as well as interdimensional beings, which told humans tragedy is coming it, it's a cataclysm like you cannot imagine we need to save you and we need to save whatever you can save either come down into the earth or some beings were taken up into the sky and then the cataclysm hit and wiped out almost everything and then some come back down from the sky and then others come back up from the earth and so these these people that were to become this tribe, well, they arose from the earth and they looked and what did they see? There was a great mist, a great fog, a great haze over the entire planet. And so they prayed and they did their rituals and eventually it lifted and the sun started coming out. And then they headed to the east. They headed towards the trees and the water and the fertile lands and, and the abundance and it's so interesting to see this because if we look back to the timeline they're talking about, I feel completely they're talking about the Younger Dryas event. They're talking about the cataclysm of the Younger Dryas. So their history is really going back to that event about 11,700 years ago. And the repopulation of the earth after the ant people took uh, some down into the earth and we have people going into the earth in massive numbers in the Grand Canyon area also in Turkey in Darin Kiyu and you know then eventually re-emerging when the disaster was over and just think about it with all those asteroid impacts or whatever they were 
Absolutely, it would have kicked up a lot of clouds. It would have kicked up a lot of dust and settlement. And so, you know, they had to wait for it to settle down before they could travel out and start to see what they could do to, to you know, basically do a salvage reclamation pro project with the land and start to rebuild. They hold the same stories. And again, there's numerous stories of people coming from the sky, these intelligent beings, and, and helping them and guiding them. And then, of course, they also have their dark more demonic beings that were looking to um, take advantage of them at the same time. Interestingly enough, too, they also be believe that humans were infused with more than one uh, essence, let's say, you know, and it, to me, it, it also is so much what's taught in Taoist philosophy and Qigong philosophy with you have a, a soul aspect, a universe, uh, a I should say a eternal soul aspect, but you also have the three Hun and the seven Po spirits, and the three Hun are again, um, you know, there's like the guardian angels that are trying to guide you on a high on the high road, and the Pun, the Po, I should say, are more the earthly uh, tempta temptations to be of a little bit more. Uh, lower frequency and, and not really a lower frequency per se as in a dark demonic frequency but just more of a carnal nature you know concerned with survivability again you could relate it to the the ego and we have to have some of that to keep us alive and in bodily form mm -hmm. ego is so important ego keeps us alive you know but everything going back it's all about balance so i mean do you have a little too much of that ego and is that making you do something maybe wanting you to feel more like you're fitting in or is it helping you with your survivability so it's all about mm, balancing that but i've always understood that people are made up of different beings like there is the eternal soul but there's many different other beings inside of you and a lot of times that might be viewed as uh, some type of mental illness and they like to treat that and very well-meaning people have put away other people or you know put them in a hospital because they were afraid of that. And I, I understand that. You know, I, I really think about, uh, have concerns with, you know, no, thinking that people, because they don't understand me and because they don't understand where this information comes from, it, it makes them afraid and they're very scared. And some people are just kind of curious where they just want to talk to you. Um, and then they get their information and then they just sort of leave out of your life out of your life but it is something very curious but I guess the takeaway is is understand that there's different beings and entities inside of you all of them they too have an ego there they have their own agenda going on and it's about really embracing all of those parts with love and understanding and respect and being able to talk to them in a way where they can understand and you can understand because until you have these conversations out with these other beings that might be living inside of you or your energy field like they're not quiet I don't know how many times you guys have ever had like that record player in of information playing in your mind and it just will not stop it just keeps going round and round and round well if you have this going on I always tell people try writing it down on a piece of paper because this is a being it wants to be heard it wants to be understood and if you write that down on paper and you can close the book or you can burn it whatever the point is is that you recognized it you gave it a voice you gave it um, its own individual attention and then it will go away it will go uh, on about its path so this is a really complicated world we live in. We are multi-dimensional beings and it's just not understood. That part of things is not understood and it can really frighten people. I thought it was interesting too because in general uh, they would view the son as the father but there is one story where uh, they are again being taught by beings from the sky and they're referring to the sun look at the sun as your mother 
And I thought that was curious because, you know, there's this general tendency to view the sun as the father, but then the beings from the sky were saying, this, you know, look to the sun as your mother. Look to, yeah, I could see that. Look, look to that plasma as the making up of your body. Ultimately, it's all blended together, but the two energies need each other to create form. You know, and, and we've shared with you before, it, it's you could find um, articles talking about the fact that the U.S. Uh, military would, would hire uh, Native Americans to be their scouts and their trackers and stuff. And when they made them cut their hair and put on the you know, U.S. Uh, outfit, the uniform, their abilities declined and diminished and, and really were not uh, way above normal like they were when they were in their own native garb with long hair. Uh, again, it's the conformity of the system. Think about, you know, again, time and time again, we see that yet you must conform. You must conform. And, and this is, again, uh, it's just a telltale sign of the system. So any belief system in which you know, basically conversion is the goal, is a controller system. That controller system, it just, it needs everything to be in place <clears throat> so that you're not taken out of that realm. There's so many different parts that <clears throat> they need you to play to keep their system going. And that includes making you feel kind of like an outcast or making you feel like, you're just simply too different. So it's just a safe thing to do to conform and jump back in the herd because that's a basic survival instinct. And they do understand the human psyche very, very well, these controllers do. So that's how they write their book to keep uh, everyone under control. Absolutely. And and as we see, you know, the Every tribe ends up at some point becoming a merger between uh, the conquerors and their old heritage. And, and such is the case here. There was uh, somebody that did a research paper on Creek belief systems, Muskegee belief systems. And they were interviewing people and numerous ones say, well, I don't know. You know, I, I heard grandfather say this story or grandmother say that story, but I'm a Christian. And I really don't know. I, I know Jesus and that whole story. And this is how the system works. It, it wipes away the past. Even when we look to some of the symbols, a lot of these symbols are universal. This one right here, there you go. For It's a cross, right? It's an equilateral triangle. Again, in, in many systems, this represents a balance of the energies. The circle can represent uh, a lot of things, in, in, including eternity, the universal nature of things, the whole. Uh, this almost looks like Celtic knot work, does it not? Again, there's a universality that we see be behind symbols and stories. And the Trail of Tears is something that's still in uh, my DNA and Cindy's too, as we, f we feel that strongly approximately one mile due east of this particular marker, which is in Alabama, um, back down the old federal road called by the frontiersmen and Indians the Three-Notch Trail, or the Three-Chopped Way, stood Fort Mitchell, an early 19th century American fort that in 1836 was one of the principal gathering places for the forced removal of the Creek Indians from their home on the Chattahoochee River to the west. Weakened out by starvation, defrauded of their lands, and swindled out of most of their possessions, thousands of creeks, including some in chains and shackles, made the forced journey from Alabama to what's now Oklahoma, where many of their descendants now live. Alabama also remains the home of many Creek Indians today. So again, you know, it always hits me when I listen to people and you know, they'll say things like, well, this is my my Texas or my, you know, send the Mexicans home, that type of thing. It's like, well, it was part of Mexico before it was part of the U.S. And then Texas was an independent nation briefly for itself, and it might be again. And the fact is that, you know, this is just a nonstop. One tribe always being pitted against the other. One people always being pitted against the other. One belief system always being pitted against the other. 
this is what we need to wake up uh, from. So to me, when I hear people talk about that in that, in that sense, it just makes me want to just shake my head because now what's going to happen? There's going to be a new trail of tears, you know? And so again, everybody that has lived so comfortable here in the U.S., you know, we're going to we're going to find ourselves uprooted and shifted off into a new place, a new designated space, so to speak, to make room for the new. <laughs> it repeats itself. This is karma. This is karma in so many ways. And the controllers know how to uh, bring us nothing but negative karma. So here you see the Cherokee and the Creek Nations. This is a map. Uh, an exhibit in U.S. Supreme Court case shows the pre-statehood Creek Nation land at the center of a high-stakes dispute before the high court. So again, Oklahoma, which was also known as Indian Territory, yeah, became their their new home along with Cherokee and, and many other nations, again, that were uprooted, kicked off their land. This is nothing but just conquest. And, you know, here again, home of the free and of the brave it's always been uh, a travesty to to you know again you're you're under the control system and think about how we are sold all these bills of goods just stoking our egos stoking stroking our egos you know oh we are the land of the free and the brave what, well what about these people that got uprooted and shifted somewhere that you know, was a thousand or more miles away f from where they called home. Yeah, that's not a very, very free act. And, and that's not brave either. You know, again, it's just part of the control matrix. And as we go so deep into this one, I start thinking this is more of an E.E. Arts than Hart's own because, you know, we're talking so much about the control matrix and I wanted to keep Hearts Home just on, on the lighter side. But this is what we see going on today. Because, again, we've all heard of those camps. Those FEMA camps and other camps that will be set up, you know, when we have a new rule in, in uh, our particular country here in the USA. And so, you know, those of us that have, you know, thought it couldn't happen to us, it can. Because this, this happens nonstop. This is modus operandi and part of what they are trying to hide from us is the reality of our existence as you look at some of these mounds the mississippian culture oh it, it, it's a really curious culture the mound builders you know pyramids you you have older structures here in north america you have actually older structures in Louisiana that are older than the pyramids over in Egypt. It's part of the same uh, global culture that was existing prior to um, this dark age. And yeah, these beings, they chose to live in what we might call a very simple manner, a rudimentary manner. It was done because they understood the balance that needed to be kept with nature and no it's not a bs balance like we see with the climate change no that's that's all again what they do is is they always take a truth they distort it and they use it to their uh, advantage they do this time and time and time again i know and, and it's about we have to realize that and recognize it and go within and really find out who we are minus all the stuff that it we're being told through all the different various forms of of media and that includes on a spiritual sense too we really need to know ourselves and make sure that this information is coming from within instead of from without we always have to measure that and know who you are find your baseline understanding of who you are and then you expand out from there and remember always love and appreciate yourself even the parts of you that you find not so desirable those are the parts of you that need love the most those are the parts of you that feel the most neglected and i can tell you when it comes to things that happen in our lives that we perceive as bad 
that's that darkness is our greatest teacher that darkness is imperative for us to rise up and evolve and move into different paradigms so just be really good to yourself understand how special you are you are a multi-dimensional being and get the information you get make sure that's coming from the inside absolutely so yeah when we look to their traditions and stuff and they recognize the existence of beings that had built so many things before they did and before they came here and we see evidence of that all through uh, many of the megalithic sites when we look down into peru and mexico and and other locations bolivia Ecuador, um, we will find that the farther back in time you go, the more superior the craftsmanship is. And when we look to these mounds in these, you know, many cases, these are pyramidal structures um, that have been built a long time ago. They will tell you about the different races of giants that were there. And the giants were hunted down and exterminated, and the giants' belief systems were eradicated, and the, gi the giants' traditions were destroyed. Now, you know, they give a, a very controller-based um, viewpoint on the giants from the Abrahamic tradition, being that these giants are all the byproduct of the fallen angels and enter breeding with humanity. But, you know, the truth is, there were many different types of giants. Yes, some of them had, uh, you know, a, a way about them that you want to avoid them at all costs. Others were quite gentle and quite um, benevolent and, and friendly towards others. Yet they were all eradicated. And as we've heard from the controllers now, you know, this is the last generation or so of Homo sapiens. And yes, because... Many of us are going to evolve into something much, much better, and others are going to be trapped in something much, much worse. But Homo sapiens sapiens will be no more, just like, you know, again, you might have a few stragglers here and there, just like Bigfoot that we were talking about in the various types of Bigfoot. But yeah, it was a concerted effort to wipe out that, was be that which was before, which was less controllable, and had too many of the secrets that the control system can't let out. When you look to the Book of Enoch, you know, and I, I read that and I remember, you know, thinking, oh, wow, I'm going to finally get the history. This is like, you know, 35, 40 years ago. And then realizing there's something wrong here. It just doesn't feel right because it's still from the controller narrative. You'll see that all these groups in the creek are, are no different. They talk about the variety of beings that come from the sky. A variety. Some are very, very benevolent. Some not so benevolent. Again, you have to have discernment. Discernment. If you're only looking at things from one point of view, you're, you're not going to be able to discern. You have to look at the bigger 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 picture and so this is creation creation myths and legends of the creek indians it's 350 pages and it does include a lot of the stories and things we were giving an abbreviated um an abbreviated version of alabama the celestial skiff yeah the boat in the sky Oh, yeah, ascended up towards the sky after and, yeah, came on down, yeah. And, and you know, there's you could read a lot of this as modern-day abduction phenomenon. And some of it does sound like the legends of, of the fairy people, too, where you have lost time because you're so uh, enraptured in some of these more elemental beings and different density beings. You know, just recently, Cindy and I had a a little time of lost time and you know being uh in a different area that we know we're going to be spending more time in uh i think there's a potential for us to lose a lot of time because of the energy that's in a particular area but just it's fascinating 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 to look at these myths because again with knowing myths from so many other people around the world and then reading these myths it it, they all go together. They go together so wonderfully. And again, the creation story to me, it, it's echoes of the younger Dryas coming out after cataclysm. 
and resettling. And so they, they emerge from the west and they head to the east. They head towards the rising sun. Oh, fascinating. And this is getting into some of the, the deities again. Very, very interesting stuff. If we would all delve more into all the different belief systems. Now, one of the things, too, that they believed in was that, you know, you don't really die when you <laughs> die. <laughs> you just leave your body. And they even believe, too, that it's possible to leave your body through effort, meditation, and consciously leave your body at will. But you do leave your body when you dream and you go explore other realms. And they also believed, again, that we are cohabitating here with the visible and invisible world, which is full of all sorts of different beings. This is something that, like all the indigenous people around the globe, you find the same things. And this is about the current Muskegee Nation. So I hope you guys found this interesting and look forward to your comments and questions and let us know what other directions you want us to go deeper into. Indeed. Source bless and namaste. Namaste.